You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Welcome to 7.30. I'm Lee Sales. Okay, that's a lie. You're listening to No Filter and I'm Mia Friedman. I'm also not a political interviewer, let alone one of Lee Sales' calibre, but my guest today is a politician, so I'm cutting her grass a little bit. It's the Federal Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg. Josh has one of the most important jobs in Australia right now. Ever since COVID, being the Treasurer has never been more visible to ordinary Australians. Usually the Treasurer is only front and centre once or twice a year during budget time. I'm not even sure if budgets come out once or twice a year. More proof that I'm not Lee Sales. But when there's a global pandemic, when millions of Australians find themselves suddenly, frighteningly out of work, when the Treasurer literally holds the key to the futures of so many, well, what's that like? What was it like being in the most powerful rooms in Australia when life and death decisions were literally being made? But this was a national crisis and it needed all hands on deck and we were making decisions in real, really rapid time in a way that you haven't seen in Australia since the Second World War. Josh hadn't planned on being a politician. He was going to be a professional tennis player. You may have seen the photos that went viral last year of a guy in his very early 20s holding a tennis racket and sporting a mullet. He also spent some time working as a jackaroo. But he's been an MP since 2010, and he married and became a dad later in life than many of his peers. I had questions about that. And of course, I had questions about what's currently going on in Canberra. But just a note, this interview was recorded before the Women's March. Here's Josh. It's been a really hard time as a woman to watch some of the stories that have come out. Why would any young woman or older woman want to get into politics? Well, I think it's been a hard time for women. I mean, those allegations have been deeply disturbing and distressing. To see what had happened to Brittany Higgins, for example, was absolutely shocking. Mm. And I think everyone's been affected by events of recent weeks. We need to improve the culture and, of course, the conduct in Parliament House. And there's now a formalised set of reviews and processes to do that. So Kate Jenkins as the Sex Discrimination Commissioner is going to reach across the political divide and work on those related issues. A colleague of mine, Cecilia Hammond, who's been the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Notre Dame, she has experience in dealing with these types of issues in institutional settings, so she's going to be working with colleagues Mm. um, through these matters. And we've also got the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet also undertaking a review. So hopefully out of those processes and reviews, we'll get some concrete actions Mm, mm. which will lead to significant change. Parliament House needs to be an exemplar. Mm. It needs to be a role model for the rest of the community, not fall below community expectations and standards. And how can men also help with this? Claire O'Neill, a Labor MP, spoke about, and she wasn't even talking about political sides, but she said the atmosphere in Parliament House is very much that alpha male vibe. And I think every woman knows what that means, like men sitting on couches and talking loudly. And Are they more like you there? There are a lot of good people Mm. in Parliament House who feel absolutely shocking about events of recent weeks and who do want to see that cultural change. But, you know, obviously events of recent weeks have undermined a bit of the public's confidence, Mia, in... Mm, in A lot of the public's confidence. ...in the institution, and I think that's a bad thing Mm. because it is, after all, the Parliament of Australia. It's where you elect people to go and represent you. And so that's why we all need to do better and to change the culture and to change the culture fast. There are some wonderful role models across the parliament, but not just at the federal level. You also reference state parliament. And, you know, on our side of politics, obviously, Gladys Berejiklian is one. She's been formidable through this crisis. And then on the other side of politics, look how Julia Gillard has handled herself and with great decency and strength as well. And she's been a role model Mm. for so many people across the community. So, You can find fantastic 
role models out there Mm. who can lead us in a better way. I was reading this morning that our economy is roaring back. Our growth is 31%. It's higher than any of the other G7 countries. Business confidence is returning. Jobs are coming back. Have you got to the point where you were exhaling after the 12 months that we've had? Well, at the peak of this crisis, we were very much staring into an abyss. It's easy to lose sight Did now. you feel a bit sick at the start? Very uncertain, mm. very concerned, but it's easy to lose sight now as the economy is recovering and 94% of those who either lost their jobs or saw their working hours reduced to zero back at work, but it's easy to lose sight of what it was back then. You remember those horrible pictures, heartbreaking pictures of thousands of our fellow Australians lying up outside Centrelink. Mm. That was a very dark time. And Treasury came and said to me that the unemployment rate could reach as high as 15%. It's now 6.4%, which would have meant another couple million people Mm. unemployed, which has long-term consequences. So I'm very proud of what 25 million plus Australians have been able to achieve to get us to this point. It's always been a health crisis first. So the fact that we've suppressed the virus successfully is putting Australia in a position that the economic recovery can take place. But the numbers, whether it's the amount of money that's been spent or the number of decisions that have been taken, or indeed the death toll as well, are quite illustrative. Just to give you one set of numbers, Mia, in the United States, the number of people who have died per million from COVID is more than 1,500. In Canada, it's more than 500. Yet here in Australia, it's around 35. So we have fared so much better. We've tragically had deaths. But the fact that we haven't had large numbers in an ICU ward Mm. or on a ventilator has meant that we've escaped the worst of what other countries have gone through. In terms of who was front and centre during those most frightening weeks where we just did not know what was going to happen, we were like, are we going to be Italy? Are we going to be America? It really became about the premiers and you who were front and centre. I know that... And the Prime Minister, he led from the front and nothing yeah. should be taken away from what he did. The Treasury usually isn't that much of a flashy front and centre job. Like, I would say the same thing about the premiers. Like, most people wouldn't have even known who their premiers were or let alone premiers of other states before that, COVID. That's for sure. It was very much an apolitical time and people who didn't matter whether they voted Liberal or Labor, there was a feeling of gratitude that the people in charge seemed to know what they were doing. Was that a different feeling as a politician? I think one of the real lessons out of this crisis is how when you listen to that professional advice, whether it's from the health workers, the health professionals mm. and the chief medical officers, or whether it's you know from Treasury, how that helps you deal with crises such as these. And Brendan Murphy, who was the chief medical officer and now the secretary of the Federal Health Department, he played a key role. But as you say, at the state's level as well, and I think National Cabinet has been effective, even though there's been differences between Premiers and the Prime Minister, or even differences between the Premier of New South Wales and Queensland, Mm -hmm. there has been a forum for them to regularly come together and to meet and to work through issues, whether it's the vaccine rollout or the economic support. Mm. JobKeeper, et cetera, et cetera. Or the border closures or whatever the the issues are, Mm. they can sit and Do you have a WhatsApp group? Well, we as treasurers meet in that alternative fortnight that the leaders are not meeting. Mm -hmm. And I chair that group and it's called the Council on Federal Financial Relations. And three of the treasurers are also leaders so the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory mm. and the ACT are also their so treasurers. So they're on weekly and duty. The, and the Chief Ministers of the ACT and the Northern Territory are also treasurers and the Premier of Tasmania is also the treasurer. So there's been a bit of overlap, but it's important because obviously Treasury and that portfolio has been front and centre of the response. What was that year like for you? Like from Tough. a personal, from a personal point to of view? To be away from home for the vast bulk of the year And that was overlaid by the fact that Victoria went into lockdown and I've got young kids, a beautiful daughter called Gemma, who's six and a son, beautiful son, Blake, who's four and a loving wife, Amy. And I won't say her age, but (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but, uh, she's a superstar. But they were all in lockdown. and And where were you? 
And I was in Canberra for the vast bulk of it. I was able to come home occasionally. But for them to you know, not be able to move more than five kilometres from their home or to be indoors 23 hours a day, mm. for the kids to be homeschooled, for Amy to work from home, all of that meant that they were under pressure just as other Victorian families Did were. Did you feel guilty? No. That you weren't there? Because I was never made to feel guilty in doing what I do and Amy has been incredibly supportive. But this was a national crisis and it needed all hands on deck and we were making decisions in real, really rapid time mm. in a way that you haven't seen in Australia since the Second World War. What was it like in Parliament House? A lot of people, I imagine, went home. People had to lock down. Was everyone like in... Mufti, was it kind of like you were in your trackies and your hoodie, you know, doing uh, your meetings? You know, that's not normally my wardrobe. But um, <laughs> What's your off-duty wardrobe? I don't think I've seen you without a tie. Uh, well, I, I don't like her, but I don't want to give the people the wrong <laughs> idea. Um, Are you a mammal? No, I'm a bike. I, I love the bike. I love my sporting gear. And, you know, obviously I was trying to keep up the exercise mm. over the course of those difficult days. But the atmosphere was quite surreal in Parliament House Mm. because when Parliament was meeting, there's no one in the galleries. There's not the number of staff that would otherwise be there. And so it sort of feels like a bit like an empty shell Mm. compared to what it normally is as a hub of and a hive of activity. Activity and and all of that. Formality. Um, Did it feel, I don't know, like less formal? Did it feel a bit like being at camp? What was the vibe? Very serious. Mm. Obviously, we used the technology for as many virtual meetings. The Cabinet met virtually, for example. You know, there were times when the Prime Minister and I, we might have been in our respective offices, but we weren't allowed to be in the same room because I may Mm. have been in Melbourne and a few other things. So everyone was always closely following the medical advice, but there was a different atmosphere in Parliament. It was very serious. Mm. It was very workmanlike. And, you know, I think everyone rose to the occasion. Got it done. You're listening to No Filter with Federal Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. I want to ask you about the women in your life. Let's start with Amy. How long have you guys been married? Well, we've just had our 10th anniversary. And you're about my age, aren't you? Are you 50 yet? Soon. Soon, same. Mid-year. Same. You met Amy how? And a bit later in life? Met at a bar. We were there for different reasons. I was there for a friend's drinks and she was there for a different friend's drinks. Uh, drinks bar in Melbourne. Bar in Melbourne. We got talking. It was during the GFC. I'd been at that time working in investment bank. How did you get talking? Like were you just standing at the bar? Like Pretty much so. Pretty much so. And um, we just got talking. Yeah. She's a lawyer who works on employment-related issues. I was working in investment bank. We didn't swap numbers and that was it. And then I worked up the courage to ring her uh, How did you a find few her? days later. Well, I knew where she worked, so I rang her at the office. Nice. Whoever answered the phone went to her and said, look, there's a Josh Frydenberg on the phone here. And she said, Josh Frydenberg, how do I know that name? Oh, okay. I remember this guy. He worked in a bank. I was speaking to him recently at a bar. Maybe he's like all the other bankers that I know at the time, who's losing their jobs and is coming to me for advice. <laughs> so she started to put she's on, an employment lawyer. So she put on her clock to take the call. So lawyers do that billing thing where uh, they literally put the clock on. Mia, that six-minute thing. And so she put the clock on. Start and, the clock, Josh. And pretty early on she realised when I asked her out <laughs> that I wasn't coming for Stop employment the clock. advice. And then we kicked it off with dinner and drinks and it's been fantastic ever since and did you know got two beautiful kids straight away was it a slow burn i think we knew straight away that we clicked and as we got to know each other it strengthened from there and yeah we got engaged while overseas on a trip and we got married at the end of 2010 and kids you've got young kids how old is blake Blake is four. Gemma You've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old. Yeah, who get on well. So that's and all Amy works. Amy works a few days a week yep. as a lawyer, and she, you know, juggles lots of different things. And obviously, having me away from home is is not easy. Mm. But it's probably not too dissimilar to a lot of families who've got partners who are working either shift work or in the military who have to travel or mm. other um, vocations. 
Do you think that having a two-parent working family gives you insights into the lives of a lot of Australians? Well, I don't think it's unique. I think, But a lot of politicians don't. You know, Annabelle Crabb famously wrote that book, The Wife Drought, about her experience of noting that, that most male politicians that she sees in Canberra have full-time stay-at-home partners. My wife loved that book, by the way. It was a great book. And Annabelle's argument was women need wives and men need lives, which means that men can have more, you know, because it's great. I imagine you're a pretty involved dad, or can't you be? Well, I hope I'm very involved. And certainly when I'm home, I'm working doubly as hard to be present as well. And just to do little things and to make those little things big things. So, you know, going down to the park, taking one of the kids on their scooter or for a hot chocolate or whatever the case may be, just trying to carve out some time with them, even if it's shooting down the coast for one night Mm. uh, to a place called Lawn that we love in Victoria, just turning that limited period of time into something more special. But I can tell you from talking to my female colleagues how difficult it's been for them having to make the weekly trip to Canberra, particularly for my colleagues, for example, from Western Australia, Mm. who leave their families behind, make that long journey, or from regional Queensland or regional South Australia, where you may spend half a day just making it into Adelaide or or to Brisbane or to uh, Perth, and then you've got to make the trip over into Canberra itself. And so you don't want to underestimate how challenging that's been and both male and female colleagues but I know for a number of my female colleagues who have had younger children they've spoken about those challenges and maybe in some cases it's led them to leave politics earlier than they may have liked. Mm. What do your kids think you do for a job? They do know that I'm the treasurer whether they... What do they they think that means? It means dealing with money and (laughs) handing it out um, which has happened more of the time recently that's for sure. Dad's the boss of the money. Yeah I love their drawings because I think it gives you an insight yes. into what they're thinking. So that whether they're drawing the sun or the Eiffel Tower or little Blake, he made the moon for me the other day and water and all these sort of things. My daughter loves Elsa and Anna, so there's a lot of mm. frozen mm. Uh, related pictures mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. But my daughter did one for me for the festival of Passover and she wrote, at the bottom, I am the treasurer's daughter. <laughs> so she's very conscious of who. <laughs> That's who a nice she is. flex. That's a nice flex. For and so a that is old. that is sitting behind my desk in Canberra. Yeah. As just a small reminder that she knows what I do, but more importantly, of her beautiful artistic talents. You know, the idea of women are often asked, how do you do it all? And that juggling and yep. the, what do you choose? And I'm always of the belief that you don't have to choose. You try to just, you know, sometimes you lean this way and sometimes you lean that way. How do you do it all? How do you imbalance a young family with one of the most important jobs in the country? Well, just as best as I can, I suppose, and take one day at a time. But what does it look like? Do you have like sometimes, I mean, you know, what happens if the Prime Minister calls or Mark Zuckerberg calls and (laughs) you're having Friday night dinner with the family? Well, the PM and I were in touch, you know, 6.30 this morning, for example. We were in contact. I was, in fact, at Kirribilli last night. And so we are in constant touch and that relationship is very strong and it's based on trust and it's a partnership. Mm. It's a respectful partnership, which is really important um, to have that in the two leadership positions. So like he's your Prime work Minister wife. The deputy. He's Everyone the pri- needs a work wife. He's, you call it what I like, um, but he's the <laughs> Prime Minister of the country and uh, and I'm his treasurer and, mm. you know, we've got a, got a lot on our plate. But it's a constant challenge just keeping your head above water. But what do you do? You like the to... phone rings and like you're torn, you plan right? Out your day. And it often starts early and finishes very late. Yeah. And there's a lot of plane trips involved, obviously less so over the last year than recently. But just in the last week, I mean, you and I are now talking in Sydney. I'm off on a plane to Melbourne. In minutes. In minutes. I'll be back to Canberra on Sunday. And over the course of this week, I've been in Brisbane, Townsville and Cairns. So, you know, it's constant movement. And when you're on the ground, you're working, whether it's events, visiting places Mm. across electorates or whether it's speaking to industry bodies or whether it's doing lunches and dinners with colleagues. Mm. There's a lot of movement and very little let up. I want to finish by asking about your mum. 
How did your mum bring you up? What did you learn about women from her? Well, the first thing is she always led by example, and I say that about my dad as well. But they treated people with respect. They worked hard. Were they immigrants? My mother was. My father wasn't, but he was the son of Polish immigrants. My mother came from Hungary Mm. post-war as a young girl. And they've been fantastic role models. They've surrounded themselves with family and friends. They've been proud of their faith. They've been big contributors to the community. My mother's a psychologist. Um, She's done a lot of groundbreaking work in a field called adolescent coping. And my dad's a surgeon, you know, who spent his life trying to make sick people healthy. And my sister's a paediatrician as well, and we get on super well, and I'm very proud of what she's been able to do. Older or younger sister? She's younger, 18 months younger, and her name's Lexi. Are you guys close? Very close. She works at the Royal Children's and has done fantastic work. Set up a uh, an all female practice of paediatricians, and they do amazing work with kids with all sorts of challenges. And um, you know, working in the health field, my dad and my sister and my mum, because of her work as a psychologist, I think they've made a terrific contribution. I, mm. I don't think they ever thought their son would be a politician. We never had a partisan household at all. Like you wouldn't have known if it was how people would vote. There was discussions about issues around the kitchen table. But me, I have to say, I I never thought I'd be sitting here talking to you about politics having become the treasurer of Australia because, you know, I always wanted to be a tennis player. You did, didn't you? And I didn't ever, never thought I would uh, You had a mullet back then. I had a mullet, now I have no Mm. hair. And so... Which was better, no hair or mullet? You'd have the mullet every day. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and everything else that went with it. Then, but, uh, do you yeah. still play tennis? I still do, and I love it. Yeah, it helps keep me sane. Sounds like you were surrounded by some pretty strong women growing up. Absolutely. And still are. And my grandmother on my dad's side, they were immigrants, and they had small, what are called haberdashery stores, so small clothing stores in country Victoria, for your listeners who know Warrnambool and Mortlake mm. and Camperdown and Colac. And I remember her packing up the Kingswood with clothes, and then driving up there herself because my grandfather would go to one one of the other shops. And and I went with her and figure this, a European woman who came to Australia with nothing. They ran small haberdashery stores in country regional Victoria. Mm. And she'd stay at the local pub across the road, stock the shelves, open it up first thing in the morning, stay over the weekend, did all by herself. But no complaints, just got on with doing it. And these are amazing stories mm of migrants and they wanted to give their kids a good education and my dad you know took up that opportunity and became a doctor and my parents wanted to give my sister and I the equal opportunities of a good education and we got that and hopefully we're putting that education into practice now last question how would you feel about Gemma getting into politics <laughs> well that's her choice or she, she has told me Gemma that she doesn't want to be treasurer. She wants to be prime minister. Fair so enough. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, she wants to be the real boss. So yeah. good on her for doing that. <laughs> she wants to be the boss of dad also. <laughs> that, well, she is already, um, and she's only six. So, But she gets to do whatever she wants, and I don't think there are any, any obstacles to that. That will be choices that she wants to make. I think it's fantastic in Australia that we've seen over recent years, Mia, first female chief justice of the High Court with first female prime minister, a first female governor general. And there was a lady called Dame Margaret Guilfoyle. I don't know if you, I know, you the know name. her. Yeah, she was the first female cabinet minister with a portfolio and then became finance minister. And she passed away recently and I gave a speech in parliament. And she was asked during her life, Dame Margaret, how do you feel about being the first female cabinet minister with a portfolio? of finance. And she said, it doesn't matter if I'm the first. What's important is I'm not the last. And Mia, that's the key because that's what my daughter will be looking to. She'll be looking to those role models out there who break those glass ceilings, which hopefully are broken now for good, and she can be whatever she wants to be and she has my support and, of course, my beautiful wife Amy's support too. I hope you enjoyed this episode of No Filter. And as always, I hope it gave you a little bit of a human insight into the person 
behind the public figure. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. And if you're not a subscriber already, please subscribe. This episode was produced by Mel Zauer. The executive producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman, and I'll see you on the Mamma Mia app.